Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I might be a little more reserved today. My asthma is messing up on me, but y'all bear with me. If you will, stand with us out of the honor to God's Word. We're going to be reading a very familiar passage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Ever heard of mass? Yeah. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now, I had this, I had this burden on my heart. Because how many has ever been in a stage in their Christian life, let's just be honest, that you just wondered where God was at? It felt like he was quiet. You don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. You feel like you've confessed every sin that you think you, could, that you even could remember, and it still feels like silence. Silence. Nothing. Well, I want to say I was in that boat one time. And I still remember I was on my way to church and, um, I mean, way to work early one morning. It had been a while and I had been asking God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I don't know what's going on, God. I'm lost right now. Not talking about I lost my salvation. I was talking about I'm lost as far as I don't know which way to turn. I don't know what to do. God, you're silent. Why? Why are you silent? And I still remember going down the road and Brother Billy Burrell was on the radio and he always did that daily bread. And as soon as I got done praying that prayer, it was me and God in the car. He says, okay, today's uh, uh, daily bread is when God is silent. I about, I, I mean, I literally just started busting out in tears right there going down the road. I just finished the prayer. Where are you, God? And he said, today is about when God is silent. See, too many times we get in these positions and we wonder how. I mean, we, we just want God to bless us. We want God to be with us. But that's the problem. Right. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for the blessings. Yes, but when your relationship depends on the blessings, you don't have much of a relationship. See, if my wife only loved me when I bought her gifts... We wouldn't have much of a relationship, would we? But that's how we treat our relationship with God. Only if he's blessing me am I in good with him. But when he's not blessing me, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, well, like one preacher said, is there even a God? We get so back and forth. We flip and we flop based on results. We've said that before. And you may be in a time in your life Right now, where you're saying, where is God at? I don't know who this message is for. All I know is God laid it on my heart on the way over here. I even told Jessica to pull some stuff up for me because this is what God changed on me. And I want you to see some things. If you look at this passage, a lot of uh, I've heard even preachers say, whenever he does the Lord's Prayer, uh, if you go to Luke, he says, 
teach us to pray. He didn't say teach us how to pray. He said teach us to pray over in Luke. First thing we got to do is be willing. And I'm not talking about coming down saying, God, give me, God, give me, God, give me, God, give me. A lot of people think that's what prayer is all about. It ain't about God, give me, God, give me, God, give me. That's part. But that's all our prayer life turns out to be many of times. Give me, give me, give me. Give me, give me, give me. Why ain't I getting this? Why ain't I getting that? Why, why, why? Sometimes God has just got to say, okay, why don't you figure it out? And he tries to let us figure it out. And we realize we can't figure it out, right? I want you to see some things. The first thing, like, the, like Luke said, we need to learn to pray. That's the first step. We need to learn to get on our knees. We have abandoned the altars. We have abandoned our Bible reading. And then we wonder why we don't have it like they used to have it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We come in with uh, soft seats, air conditioner in the car, riding down the road 60 miles an hour. You know what the old timers wanted when they wanted God? They hopped in an old time buggy. Yeah. They went through the cold. Yeah. They went through the heat. They didn't have a smooth ride. They rode the dirt roads. Right. And you know what they did? They came into a church that was not air conditioned. They came into a church where the windows were out. They came and sat on pews where they might get a splinter if they got a little edgy. Right. But they, that showed how much they wanted God. Yeah. We have so much convenience. We want a convenient God. We want a God of convenience. And if it ain't convenient, he must have forgot about me. When we talk about this, we talk about a prosperity gospel. Jesus himself, I've never understood the prosperity gospel. Jesus himself said, the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man don't have a place to lay his head. He was homeless, y'all. But yet we want to preach a prosperity gospel. You follow Jesus, you're going to be rich. That's totally against the gospel. Don't get me wrong, he blesses his children, and I'm grateful he does. But that's not what the gospel is about. And I want you to see what he says. He says, verse 6, but thou, when thou prayest. We need to have a personal prayer, a personal relationship. And that's what's missing in the churches. There's not a personal. We come to church and we expect the preacher to feed us. And Brother Adam, you do a great job. But if that's the only thing that I get, I will starve to death. If I eat one meal a week, but see, we think that's good enough for spiritual life. It's so much more. He says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And the thing is, we want everybody to know when we do something for God. American Christianity has become showtime religion. If we, if we was to go hand out one track, we got to tell everybody in the world, I handed out a track, y'all. Am I preaching the truth? Come on, y'all. We're really quiet tonight. <laughs> But it's the truth. We got to tell any and everything, look at what I did. He says, you bet, if you want a real relationship, you wondering where God's at right now? You wondering why you don't have the close relationship like you used to? Where has that quiet time been? Where has that one-on-one -on -one time been? Hmm. What else does he say? He says, thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now I want you to see that. That what's done in secret is what's going to be brought out. It's eventually. You can't hide the truth. What's going on at home is eventually going to be brought out. If you're going to reap what you sow. If you're sowing to the Spirit, you're going to start reaping in the Spirit. But if you're sowing to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. That's biblical. I'm just tired, as the old song goes, of just the same old thing. Tradition, we're in your name. I'm tired of a man made worship power. See, we can go into church, shout the praises of God, have a good emotional stir, and then go home and live like the devil. 
And we wonder where's God at? Why is our society getting to where it's at? What does it say right here? I want you to see the six things about this Lord's Prayer. Because though he does teach us to pray, but he also says this little statement, after this manner. Yeah, after this manner. So he does teach you how to pray as well. So it's a twofold thing. He does say teach you to pray, but he also says teach you how to pray. Because he says, after this manner, pray ye. And the first one is, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed. Be thy name. You want to get in touch with God, we've got to get our worship back. You wonder where God's been in your life while he hadn't been talking to you? Have you been worshiping him? See, our eyes are on me, 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 me. That's the reason you haven't heard from him, 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 because all you can hear is you, 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 you. we got to stop saying I need this, I need that. And don't get me wrong, that's a biblical prayer in its right perspective. But the problem is, that's the first thing we do. We come to this altar, God, I need your help with this. God, I need your help with that. When was the last time we come down to an altar and just say, God, you're holy. God, you're righteous. God, I'm unworthy. And God, if I've got to go through this for your honor and glory, then so be it. God, as long as you get the glory, then I'm happy. We, I just want to pick up with what you said, Brother Adam. On Sunday, you was talking about that uh, maniac at Gadara, and he came immediately. Notice what he did, though. He came immediately. If you read on down in those verses, he fell and worshiped. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want you to think, just get this. You want to get where God's speaking to you again, you want to get to where you can feel the presence of God again, start worshiping. That's where it begins. Because this man got saved, I believe it, with all my heart. And then you realize salvation is an act of worship. Because the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That's an act of worship. That's declaring him as Lord. That's declaring him above yourself. That is is an act of worship. Even salvation is an act of worship. You've got to get back on your knees. You've got to get back to worshiping. And that's how you're going to get a relationship like you used to have. And notice, even Job. See, we just talked about a guy who had over 2,000 uh, demons in him. And something good happened. Like you said, he seen the winds and the waves be stilled. He saw a, mir a miracle so no matter how bad you are, and it don't matter how good the circumstances, you got to worship. But with Job, it was the opposite. A perfect and upright man, askewed in all his ways. And the worst day I would say that anybody ever experienced would be Job right there in the human form, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what he did? No matter how good he was, no matter how bad the situation was, he got down and he started worshiping. You want God? Stop worrying about who's sitting beside you. Stop worrying about who's sitting behind you. Stop worrying about who's seeing you. Don't let your worship be to impress somebody. And don't let yourself get embarrassed to worship. Because it's not your, that person that you're trying to impress anyway. You're trying to get in touch with a holy God. This should be a one-on-one -on -one relationship. This should be just you and just God. And nobody else is going to interfere with this relationship right now. I'm going to get down and I'm going to worship. I don't care who sees me. I don't care what they think about me. This is my God and I'm going to worship. Be careful now. Don't matter who good, how good you are, and you don't. It don't matter how bad you are. We just saw one of the worst of the worst, over two thousand demons, and he worshipped. We just saw one that God Himself said was perfect and upright, and he worshipped. You cannot be too good for worship. You cannot be too bad for worship. You need to worship. So we see that He deals with God the Father with worship. He says. Hallowed be thy name. And then what does he say? Thy kingdom come. Who is supposed to establish the kingdom? Yeah. Jesus. That's the reason they started doubting Jesus. 
So we've seen two petitions so far. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Jesus was supposed to establish that kingdom. That's the reason the Jews didn't accept Jesus. Because he was supposed to come as the Messiah. He was supposed to sit on the throne of David. And when he did not sit on that throne of David, they started doubting him. You don't understand the plan. They didn't understand the plan. You may not be understanding it in your life. That's where faith kicks in. We see worship and we see faith. God, you ain't establishing your kingdom like I thought you would right away. Yeah, it wasn't the plan. The plan was to be a sacrifice the first time. He will establish it later. So we see worship. We see faith. What else do we see? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. That's submission. Get that. We see worship, faith, and submission. You want your life to be right with God? You want to be close with God? Incorporate those three things. Worship, faith, and submission. Not my will, your will. If it costs me to make you better, so be it. I accept that, God. If it costs me that you get glory, I'm fine with it. That is when you're going to start getting a relationship with God again. That's when you're going to start drawing up to Him. And I want you to see the first three petitions in this Lord's Prayer. He says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We deal with Father. Thy kingdom come. We deal with Son. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Who is it that pricks that heart and says, You know you shouldn't do that? You know, that's that Holy Ghost. We see Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in the first three petitions. He is dealing with God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, oh, my goodness. Y'all just hold on. Now, I want you to say, you get in that position say, where you come down and you say, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you're worthy. I'm not. If it costs me, so be it. But I want what you have for my life. If it costs me dearly, God, if you get the glory, if you ever get to that point, my goodness, you better hold back. The barn's will about to be busting. But notice what else he says. There's three more. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Now I want you to notice what he says about that. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Bible teaches us to take no thought of tomorrow. But I want you to see that. We've always got to have everything figured out a week in advance. God, this has got to happen, and that's got to happen, and this has got to happen. Jesus prayed, give us this day our daily bread. Wow. He says, I need it right on time. We have a God that's always right on time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let him get you through today. You want to have a happy life? Worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. I'm not saying don't plan for tomorrow. The Bible does teach us to plan, but don't worry about tomorrow. Big difference. Don't worry about what's going to happen on the job tomorrow. I bet you, I've been guilty many a times, I bet you if we come in here and we took an honest survey, a lot of us may have come in, I've got this to do tomorrow, I've got that to do tomorrow. Kids probably thinking, man, going back to school again, oh, I can't stand school. And we have missed the blessing of tonight because we're getting robbed thinking about tomorrow. Live where God's got you right now. He'll take care of tomorrow. That's where we've got to get. Another thing is, notice that talked about the body. Notice we're made of body, soul, and spirit. God's made of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We were made in His image. We've already discussed that. So now we see that He's praying for the body. The body needs the food. The body needs that to keep going. So he's actually praying for our body. It's okay to pray for the body, but notice what he did. He dealt with Father, Son, Holy Ghost before he ever got to me. We got to get our perspectives right. Our prayers always start out with me, 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 me. It should start out with him, 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 him. 
And I want you to see what else he says. He says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I see the soul right there. He's praying for his soul because that's that eternal being. That's that soul that's never going to die. I want you to see that he, God prayed for your body. He prayed for your soul right here. He don't want you to die and go to hell. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's where you need to come and you need to say, God, forgive me of my debts, please. And I, I never... I'm telling you, we all struggle with this. Let's not be hypocrites tonight. There's somebody in our life that we have a trouble forgiving. It's real quiet right there. I'm sure everybody had somebody come to their brain right there. Man, but how much more has God forgiven us than we need to forgive them? That's what he says. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We want God to forgive us, but we don't want to do none of the forgiving. Now, I'm not saying trust. Trust and forgiveness are two different things. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is given. It's a gift. I'm not saying you need to put yourself back in the same position to be done the same way again over and over and over and over and over. It just means when you forgive someone, you hear their name, you see their face, that anger, that bitterness, that rage just don't come all over you. That's how you know if you've forgiven someone. Don't mean you got to go hang out and be buddy-buddy with them anymore and let them stab you in the back over and over and over. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is a gift, not only to that person, but for yourself. That's the reason it's a twofold word, forgive. Give. It's a gift. And for means I have made up my mind ahead of time. I am going to give this gift. I don't care what they do to me anymore. I'm not letting them control me. When you're carrying bitterness, anger, rage, they control you. They are in your head. They've messed with your heart. You're giving them way more power than they deserve. You got to let it go. Because I'm glad. God could have looked at me and says, Derek, I ain't letting it go. You're going to hell. But he didn't. He says, I'm going to let it go. Finally, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we've seen body, soul, and now we see spirit. The Bible says a broken spirit, who can bear? You know, when we go through troubles, we go through trials, we go through temptations, you know what that's doing? It's wearing on our spirit. A lot of people think the soul and the spirit are the same thing. No, the Bible says dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. They are two separate things, people. You want to know the difference? That's what makes the difference between you and an animal. An animal has a spirit, but it don't have a soul. Understand that. And see, a plant, it don't have soul or spirit. It just has a body. Three forms of life. Hmm. And you have body, soul, and spirit. Each one takes a step up even further. Oh, it's, un it's almost like somebody designed this thing. Huh. But we all know that happened by chance, didn't it? Yeah, whatever. But I want you to see, here is going to be one of the biggest lies you're told. God ain't going to put more on you than you can bear. The Bible literally says God is, uh, will not tempt you above that you are able, but with the temptation, he will make a way of escape. See, we like to cut stuff off and not say the whole context. He says he's going to make a way to escape. If you don't take that way to escape, it's going to be more than you can bear. It's going to be more because he that's what brings you back to him. If you're drowning there in a lake and I throw you a lifeline, a lifeline and you don't take it, that's on you. You had a way to get out. Jesus gave you a way to get out. But if you don't take it, don't think you can handle it 
I know this ain't popular preaching, brother. But you want to get close to God again? See, we think God is all about thou shalt, thou shalt not. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. That was in the Old Testament, and it's still relevant. But we're so worried about crossing our T's, dotting our I's, when well, God cares if I do this, God cares if I do that, God cares if I do the other. No, God wants to have a relationship with you. And if your relationship with Him is right, all that other is going to take care of itself. You will start living right if you've got a right relationship. You ain't got to worry about crossing every T and dotting every I because I've got the liver on the inside of me. And if I start doing something that's out of His will and I'm close to Him, He's going to be like, that's not right. That's not right. And I don't have to worry about all that crossing the T's and dotting the I's because God's going to reveal it to me. If I'm doing something wrong, it's going to be revealed to me. But we've got, and that's the reason so many people struggle with sins because they're trying to fight it on their own saying, I can beat this. I can beat this. You cannot beat that. It's too much for you to bear. But God has made a way of escape. You've got to take it. So when the next time somebody says, well, God ain't going to put more on you than you can bear, say, yes, he will. As long as you take the way to escape, it won't be more than you can bear. But if you reject that way to escape, there's a whole lot of people in hell tonight saying, this is more than I can bear, God. This is more than I can bear because they rejected the way to escape. The next thing... He says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want you to notice he started out saying, God, it's about you. He ended up saying, God, it's about you. If your prayer life will be, God, it's about you. But if you would give me just a little handful on purpose every now and then, I would appreciate it. You know what? God's going to bless the socks off of you. And I'm not talking about you may have a filthy rich bank account but you know what he'll give you your daily bread now this this is also unpopular preaching brother but we always love to use that verse over there where David said I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread what that's saying is it's just so rare that happens how are you going to explain Lazarus Lazarus sat at the feet of the rich man begging for the crumbs. He was begging for bread, people. But you know what? He got what he needed. It's just saying it's so rare. But if you ever find yourself in that position, count yourself worthy. You're in the Lazarus boat. Lazarus made it into the Bible, making it to heaven. Hmm. See, a lot of people like to use that. But if that was the case, where I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread, means you're never going to miss a meal, then you need to go down there to Atlanta and tell every beggar, you're, I know, already know you're on your way to hell. If, they, if the righteous is never forsaken and the seed never begging for bread. See, that's not what that verse means, y'all. We like to make the Bible say what, we, what it ain't really saying. It's just saying God's going to supply your need. You ain't got to worry about it. He's going to be there right on time. Even for Lazarus, he was there right on time. And you know what? When things look dire, things look dim, you know what you need to do? Do, more, do just like Job did. God, I've had a bad day. I don't know what's going on right now. But God, I trust you. God, you're still this God whenever I had up money in the bank. God, you're still the God when I have food on my table. And if I must suffer for your sake, God, so be it. As long as you get the honor and the glory. Oh, you'll start hearing from God again. Because he's going to say, wow, you're my child. I'm not leaving you in that boat. See, when my... I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. Well, she maybe stepped out. 
But when my daughter gets a little sassy attitude saying, I need this, I need that, I want this, I want that, and I always tell her, you know what, your wants ain't going to hurt you. But when my daughter is really broken hearted, she can have almost anything she wants when she says, Daddy, I really want this, I really need this. She's coming to me with a broken and contrite spirit. I'm going to bend over backwards to make it happen for her. But when she gets that sense of entitlement, God, uh, Daddy, I need this. Maybe you have all these toys already, but I want this. If you don't give it to me, no. Uh, but we have the same attitude with God. It ain't about us. It's about Him. And if, we, if you haven't heard from God in a while, let's just all do a self-evaluation tonight. When was the last time I got down on my knees and made it about God instead of myself?